Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lars Schall, and I welcome you to the first part of a two-part interview series that I conduct on behalf of Matterhorn Asset Management in Zurich, Switzerland, with the author of this book, John Butler. John, the main topic of your book are the international affairs in finance and how they are changing. You did extensive research for it and took a time out to actually write the book of more than one year. Why has this been uh, an important topic to you? It's an important topic because if you take a look at history and if you take a look at international relations theory and if you take a look at economic theory, you find that a number of very important trends from all of these directions are all coming together in the same place. And that place is the current set of international monetary arrangements. I don't believe it's generally appreciated the extent to which international monetary relations are a function of major historical trends, geopolitical forces, and of course the underlying realities of, of economics and the way game theory and the, inter and the changing interests and strategies of actors in the game how these dynamics play out. And so I wanted to write a book that brought all of these different aspects together because this is what is making history. Yeah. And I wanted to write a book about history being made. And at the center stage are the US dollar and gold? Well, they are in center stage because the dollar is, as a legacy of the Bretton Woods system, the dollar is the world's dominant reserve currency. Prior to the dollar being the world's dominant reserve currency, Sterling was the world's dominant reserve currency. But back then, of course, sterling was linked to gold. And in fact, all currencies, all major currencies, were linked to gold. And we only formally left a gold standard in 1973 when it was decided at the Smithsonian Conference that currencies would be simply allowed to float versus each other. We take it for granted today but that system has only existed for 40 years and it's the only example throughout global history in which every major currency has not been backed by any kind of metal at all. And how do you uh, interpret the re-emergence of gold in the monetary system? It's happening in many ways. It's happening behind the scenes. The most important way in which it's happening is as one country after another begins to realize that its true national interests are not best served by perpetuating this dollar-centric system. They don't know what to replace it with necessarily, but they just begin to perceive that accumulating ever more dollar reserves does not serve their national interest. It gives too much power to the United States monetary authorities. But the United States monetary authorities, they're concerned primarily about the United States. Yeah. They're not concerned about the world at large. This is precisely what happened in the 1960s, when the dollar was still backed by gold. But in order to finance the Vietnam War and other aspects of the Cold War, and also to finance an unprecedented increase in domestic spending to finance the growth of a welfare state, building the interstate highway system, building a new telecommunications system. All of these projects were extremely costly. How did the US pay for them? They began to print more dollars than they could realistically back with their gold reserves. Yeah. We're facing a similar situation today. Uh, given its trade deficit, could the US go on back on a gold standard? Well, that's the problem. At current value, at current market value, the entire U.S. gold reserve would only cover the U.S. trade deficit for about 10 months. They wouldn't even get through one year. For the United States to remain a large net importing nation requires either of two things. Number one, they must simply become a far more competitive economy, being able to export as much as they import, which would completely transform the way the United States uh, works as an economy. And it would, in fact, it would imply a huge decline in consumption rates, which of course for the average household would mean a decline in their de facto standard of living. Politically, that's very, very difficult. The other alternative would be if you allow the price of gold to rise along with a general inflation, 
that is the dollar falling in value, then guess what happens? Your economy does become more competitive because the dollar is weakening, but your gold reserves are also rising in value. So in the, during a transition period, you are able to continue financing trade deficits for a number of years as your economy does adjust. It would be a bit less sudden, a bit less surprise. It would, be, it would come as a bit less of a shock yeah. to the United States to yeah. manage it that way. And if the value of the dollar would decline, this would be good for exports? And this it would, would help to rebalance the economy. Yeah, and it would be good to accumulate gold. From eventually, the, yes. Eventually, yeah. you get to the point where you might actually be exporting more than you're importing. And if we're moving towards a world where gold is being used to settle international balance of payments between countries, then yes, the U.S. could begin to accumulate even more gold at some point in time. This, this is a common misunderstanding regarding how gold standards work. Many people seem to believe that we shouldn't desire to go back to a gold-backed international monetary system because that will favor countries that already have the gold or say have large gold mines and can produce it and bring it out of the ground. This is not true. If you look at history, trade deficits and surpluses, you know, they, they tend to only run at you know, one or maybe two percent of total economic activity for larger economies. Only one or two percent. That's all that needs to be settled in gold in order to keep the system in balance. Today, we've been running, however, with large current account deficits, trade deficits of 3%, 4%, 5%. The only reason why that has been possible is because they're being financed with paper money. And that paper money can be created into existence by central banks, theoretically indefinitely. Mm -hmm. But that becomes inflationary. And it becomes inflationary in the most dynamic, most rapidly growing economies. They don't want that inflation to destabilize their economies necessarily. And this is leading to a general breakdown in international monetary relations. But it is not the case that if you suddenly go back onto a gold standard, that countries like the United States that have accumulated lots of gold have the advantage. No, the advantage accrues to those countries that are simply economically competitive, that are simply already in a position to export more than they import. They'll be the beneficiaries. And why shouldn't they be? Why shouldn't they? One of your scenarios for the future is that Russia and or China could challenge the U.S. via gold. Can you elaborate on this, please? Absolutely. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I borrow this particular scenario in my book uh, from James Rickards, the author of Currency Wars. I mean, he and I maintain a correspondence, and he was more than pleased to have me use it. The fact is, is that international monetary regime change has historically always been associated with geopolitical conflict. Not necessarily outright war, although that has certainly also been the case. And so it is only reasonable to see the possibility that because the dollar reserve equilibrium is breaking down, that one possible way in which it finally completely breaks down is that you actually get a geopolitical crisis, a challenge where fundamental national interests clash with the dollar's role as a reserve currency. And in my book, I use Iran as an example of a country where this could happen. That is, the US imposes sanctions on Iran, Russia and China oppose those sanctions on Iran, and eventually it gets to the point where Russia, perhaps with the backing of China and other countries, simply announces that they're not, you know, henceforth they will back their own currencies with gold, offering an alternative to the dollar, which is not backed by anything. Mm -hmm. And because Russia and China both export more than they import, a gold backing for their currencies is credible because they don't need the gold to cover a deficit, a trade deficit, because they run trade surpluses. And therefore, global investors, once they see that, you know, they can purchase Russian securities or Chinese securities, backed by gold, well, they start selling dollars in order to buy Russian rubles and Chinese yuan because they're perceived as safer. But that leads to a run on the dollar. That sends US interest rates soaring. 
that causes an economic crisis in the United States, and the United States is therefore no longer in a position to try to impose sanctions on Iran or any other country for that matter because their own economic situation domestically is in complete chaos. Yeah. It, this could happen. It could happen regarding a dispute over Iran. It perhaps nearly happened in the dispute over Syria that we saw back in August. Um, do you think um, the U.S. could react to it uh, also via gold and in the scenario of Jim Rickards via confiscation of domestic and foreign gold in the U.S.? You can't rule it out. The fact is the United States does claim to have still a very large amount of gold reserves. Now these have been unaudited for many years, but most people believe that the United States has the gold it claims it has. But what we also know is that the U.S. is a custodian for gold for essentially all of the countries that participated in the original Bretton Woods arrangements. France may have taken their gold back to France, but the vast majority of Bretton Woods participating countries left some portion of their gold in the United States, in New York, where it remains to this day. So if it did come to a conflict like that, where gold suddenly reassumed its historical importance as the international money, the United States might try to exercise leverage on the rest of the world, not only by mobilizing its own gold reserves, but by threatening to confiscate other countries' gold reserves. And what would the rest of the world do? Would they send battleships to New York Harbor to try to get the gold out? That wouldn't work. But one, yeah. wonder, but one wonders where it leads. No one knows where it leads, but it could, it could lead to some sort of conflict. We are here in Düsseldorf in Germany, and Germany has a large portion of its gold in the US. Right. Now, given this background that we just talked about, do you think it's good for Germany to leave it there? I mean, they say, for example, they need it there because uh, New York is a gold trading center. Is New York a gold trading center like uh, London is, for example? Historically, it's not. I mean, historically, London was the original global gold trading center. Um, I mean, by global, I mean when the whole global economy had essentially been reached out to by the Europeans. And you could argue that you know, the Venetians were the gold yeah. trading center. But, but you know, with respect to modern history, it was London. New York has always been much more US-centric. Gold reserves in New York have always you know, once upon a time when gold reserves were behind everything in principle, gold reserves in New York were primarily there to finance domestic United States economic expansion. The move westward, for example, building the railroads, fighting yeah. the Civil War, you know, all, all these big historical uh, developments in the United States. Whereas in London, you know, the gold has been associated with the British Empire and has been associated with a tremendous degree of economic integration that took place in Europe itself during the 19th century. So London gold reserves have always had an important international aspect to them in, in their use. It's not really tr as true of New York. So there is a quality difference between New York and London and also therefore um, for the Germans to have their gold rather in London than in New York. I think there's more than one reason why London, in theory, makes more sense. It is a more international location for international finance. The foreign exchange business is based more in London than it's based in New York. Why shouldn't that be the case with gold? But there's another point. The UK is still in the EU. There are some British who want to leave, but they're still part of the EU. If I were Germany, I'd be a bit more comfortable having my gold within the EU as the single largest member economy of the EU. That would also make logical sense. And simply, it's physically closer. I mean, in the event that you did want to move it from a foreign location to a domestic location, clearly, logistically, it would be far quicker and easier to move it from London to Frankfurt than from New York to Frankfurt. Yeah. Now, if there was a gold standard, to what extent would the price of gold rise if it becomes remonetized? A gold standard can only work if it's stable. It can only be stable if it's credible. It can only be credible if the price of gold is high enough that the existing gold in the world would be perceived by economic actors 
to easily cover the imbalances that exist in the world today and facilitate those imbalances being wound down. And by imbalances, I mean cross-border trade imbalances, I mean excessive debts relative to economic growth potential. All, these are all imbalances. What price of gold corresponds to that? There are various ways to try and estimate it. The simplest way is to simply look at paper money in circulation and to say, okay, some portion of that paper money in circulation would have to be backed by gold reserves if the, if the gold standard were to be perceived as stable and credible. What portion? Well, it so happens when the United States dollar became the global reserve currency in the 1920s, the, the US Federal Reserve System was very young. It had only been around for a few years. The original Federal Reserve Act stipulated that the Fed could only print as many dollars such that the U.S. official gold reserve backed 40 percent of it. That is, the U.S. monetary base had to be 40 percent backed by gold. And if for some reason the gold was drained, the Fed would have to shrink the money supply. Or if the gold reserves grew, say because the U.S. was a net exporter, then the Fed could print more money in response. But it was 40 percent. That was seen as credible, in particular because the U.S. was a net exporter at the time. But this time around, the U.S. is a huge net importer. Would even 40 percent backing for the currency be enough? But let's start at that point. If you back 40 percent of the U.S. money supply, broadly defined to include bank deposits, if you back 40 percent of it with the U.S. official dollar reserve, it implies a gold price today of around $13,000 dollars. Far higher than it is in the market today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the first part of this interview series. You're welcome, Lars. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the first part of a two-part video interview series that I conduct with John Butler. And on behalf of Matterhorn Asset Management, I say thank you for watching. <laughs>